Welcome to Words From My Face. On tonight's show, we are talking entertainment. We are going to be talking about George Orwell's book, 1984, being made into a movie. We're talking about Telltale Games reviving the adventure game. We're also going to be getting into some sort of TV show. It's called Sherlock Season 4. Stay tuned. Or I'm early. It was one of the greatest round ones of all time, of all sports, ever. Do you think so? Beverly Hills Cop, Robocop crossover needs to happen. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Words to My Face. My name is Brian. With me, as always, producer extraordinaire Brendan. Yo. And we are the one and only home of the Chewbacca Chainsaws. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is Chewbacca. And um, he actually was upset with me because apparently he liked the movie that I'm about to review for the five reasons why you shouldn't watch this horrible movie. Um, I didn't understood it, stand it, but um, I'm not going to argue with him either. You just don't argue with him. Because he's a Wookiee. Exactly. With a chainsaw. Exactly. <laughs> Double exactly. But yeah, so let's just jump right into it and let's talk about the five reasons why you should not watch this horrible movie of the week. <laughs> okay, so this week I watched uh, The Imposter, or just Imposter, I believe. Um, it does star Gary Sinise. It has Mackay Pfeiffer in it. Um, the woman who's in it, I do believe she was a famous actress. I can't think of her name right now. But then there's also the guy from Law & Order Criminal Intent. He was in that, too. I don't know his name, either. But there's a lot of big people in it, and I do remember when I was a kid, and it did come out in theaters, and me thinking, hmm... That seems like it'd be a cool movie to watch. Well, I watched it. And maybe as a kid it would have been a cool movie. <laughs> but it was not as an adult. So, well, I like to think of myself as an adult at least. But let's jump right into it. So, reason number five. You should not watch. Because um, the dialogue is dull. It's unoriginal. Uh, nobody really talks like that in real life. Even though this movie is set in the future in the year 2079, I can't imagine future talk would be like that either so it really takes you out of everything when you're just like huh that's not real oh and you know who else is in the movie i forgot tony shalhoub is in the movie for the beginning and he's really the one who talks like that person and i'm just like um that's not real talking tony shalhoub aren't you monk your dialogue OCD becomes character distracting better. yes Rather very than, distracting yeah. brings you out of the out of the you become very aware that you're watching a movie yes yes it does Yes, it does. All right, so reason number four. Uh, you have the cliche bad guy, government bad guy, trying to track down this uh, imposter, so to say. They, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a background of the story. So it's a scientist who developed a bomb because we're fighting off an alien race that just for some reason came to kill us, and they're from the cliche planet called Alpha Centauri. And, yeah. You yes. mean so the real closest habitable, poss- well, not the closest, the closest Earth-like planets. But everything comes from Alpha Centauri. Just because make it's up a the new closest name. Earth-like planet. Just make up a new name. I don't care. Call it Xenu. Uh, all right. No, that is, it is know a new planet. About. All right. It might be real, but it doesn't need to be in every movie where aliens come from. That's all I'm saying. You, there's plenty of cool planet names you can make up, like, 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 um, Galactar. Planet Galactar. I like that planet name. <laughs> that would be the new movie. Okay, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, it's Galactar. Galactar. Invaders it from came Galactar. from Galactar. There you go. It came from Galactar. That is perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, back on number four. So the cliche bad guy, he's from uh, the government agency. He decides he wants to cut this guy up because he thinks he's an alien imposter without even like doing a simple like x-ray even. And it's like, you're in the future. I have a feeling you could do these things with no problem at all, but yet you're just not going to do them for some reason. It's like, it's not okay. as fun as cutting people up. Well, and, and so, yeah, and that's, I guess they had to propel the plot somehow, so they're like, let's do something stupid. Well, well, actually, I shouldn't get into that yet. I will get into that with uh, in a couple. Um, but let's go on to number three. Uh, somehow an untrained scientist, like untrained, I mean, like unmilitary trained scientist, is able to, like, totally take out like hundreds of troops it seems like at least dozens of them on his way somehow he escapes 
in the chair that they're going to rip his heart out and dissect him, and he's able to escape and gets out and kills waves and waves of government troops to escape from this base. And then when he's outside the base, he does the same thing. It's, it's the just power like, of science. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I wish. If it wasn't just, like, dumb luck and easy coincidence. Well, well it's just... that That's number four. I mean, number two, sorry. Three. I, I, no, I, three was somehow an untrained scientist gets to kill everybody. Uh, number three, two... I'm sorry, I wrote it one through five, and now I'm doing it five through one, because Brendan always have, has a problem when I go one through five, so I always have to and change everyone the else does, too. No, nobody else does. Just just me saying it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so number two is um is they use horrible horrible plot you know devices to help propel the plot there's a million times where this movie should have ended i was like okay he's captured by the government agent strapped to a chair gonna rip his heart out should be over oh they're gonna do some stupid thing to keep it going okay that's fine all right well hey uh he needs to escape well hey luckily he just ran to this elevator that somehow has an air vent that leads to a sewer that takes him miles away from this government building oh that's convenient Oh, the government agents tracked where he was. Well, now there's lead paint on all these buildings in the year 2079, so they can't use their cool device that scans through buildings to figure out where he really is. Um, mm. It just, it, it, yeah. Um, they show a little girl at ground level of, in this. There's like a 10-story apartment building that he's hiding in. They show a little girl. She's at ground level. And then, like, literally two seconds later, conveniently, she's at the top, and she throws the government agents off his trail. It's just, like, too many super convenient plot devices happen in this movie to it ever feel really good. Because you're just like, wait, why would they do that? That does not make sense. Who builds a building with an air duct connecting to an elevator that leads to a sewer that goes miles away from the building? You don't do yeah, the the real weird thing there is the connection to a sewer. You you wouldn't want ever your sewage system to be in anywhere way possibly connected to your ventilation system. Like, well, yeah, and yeah, exactly. Even through well, a, or an elevator, and then it's in the year twenty seventy nine. Maybe the air in the elevator. Maybe the air in the elevator. But it's the year twenty seventy nine, and yet there's still lead enough lead paint in these buildings. That they can't use their scanner to see through. Like I think they outlawed that back in the like 60s and 70s. Uh, so a hundred years later, I don't know what the half life is for head lead paint. I don't think it lasts that long. It might, it might, but there's a reason kids it, eat the chips because yeah. it peels off. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it might still be around, but it sounds like a new facility anyway. So <laughs> no, it, no, the the, the the building he ran into was a rundown building, but still, oh. it's just. Okay. It's long enough past. There's no paint on these walls anyway. If you see the building, it was like a rundown building where all the poor people live. And there was no paint on any wall there. So how do you have lead paint on the walls? So again, just horrible, horrible plot devices to just drive the plot forward. I guess so that the movie isn't only 20 minutes long, which it probably should have been. Um, and then we'll go to the number one reason. Uh, the twist at the end was stupid. And this is usually what you get from me is I hate these stupid twists at the end. And it was actually like a double twist. They're like, hey, I, we know how you're thinking this whole time. Now it's this. And then they're like, oh, wait, no. It really was what we made you think it was. It's like, oh, <laughs> great. So it wasn't really a twist. It was just we told you for a moment that it was a yeah. twist, that it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, that was imposter. So if you want to dull yourself um, for about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, uh, go ahead and watch this. Now, this was apparently off of a Philip K. Dick novel, so not a novel, but a short story, so might as well go ahead and read his short story, because he was actually a good science fiction writer. Uh, I believe he had a lot to do with like robotics and stuff. Man. Am I correct? No. About Philip K. Dick? Oh, you don't know Philip K. Dick? Nope. Okay. Well, he's a really big science fiction writer, so he actually did some pretty cool things. Imposter not being one of them, he probably would be crying if he was still alive seeing this movie. Like, why did you do this so horribly, guys? Why? Why? But yeah, so that was um, Imposter. It gets two Chewbacca chainsaws out of five. Not the worst I've ever seen, but certainly, certainly not the best. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and forget all about The Imposter and move on to another sci-fi topic movie. Um, and that is because recently, 
George Orwell's novel, 1984, which he wrote back in 1949. There's a lot of numbers here. 48, 49. I think it was somewhere. published in 49, but it was like written in 48. That's why they called it 84. He just flipped the numbers. Oh, okay. So, but uh, all right. So, no, that makes sense. But George Orwell is another one of those great science fiction writers who theorized a lot about the future. Uh, but his book, 1984, is being made into another movie now. Actually, back in 1984, there was a movie, 1984. But <laughs> that's neither here really? nor there. They did that? I was actually wondering yeah. about that. I was like, why wouldn't they have done yeah. that back then? But. John Hurt was actually the star of that movie back in the day. So it must not um, have been that great and this though, novel, because it hasn't lasted. You, you, yeah, the right. book last is a huge deal still, but yeah, it it's actually is still on the Amazon Hot 100 list or something like that right now. Uh, might be because of the news of the new movie, but also just because of the themes of this. We'll get into what the book really entails, but we're talking about it right now because they have just gotten a director. Uh, they have confirmed that Paul Greengrass, you might know him from our story about the Bourne series, he's actually going to be the director of this new movie. Now, it's probably not going to come out until like 2016, 2017, somewhere in there, mm. and there's no casting news as to date, but I thought that this was just a really, really cool idea for a movie, especially nowadays. You could really put a lot of the ideas and see a lot of the ideas he had that you couldn't even see those in 1984 um, really going to play. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So just to give you a little bit of backstory on the book, um, again, published in 1949, it's about a dystopian future. It actually takes place in England. Uh, I believe it's called like Neo England or New England or something like it's that. Oceania. Where Oceania. Good, good job. You got me. There you go. All right. Good thing some, one of us read the book. Not It wasn't me, but it was him. <laughs> Oceania. Um, and it's a dystopian future. Pretty much you have three giant countries that are really – or three giant groups, like government groups, that are perpetually fighting each other. And this one takes place in the England group right there. Um, and it's the, the whole area is ruled by a group called the Inner Circle. And then they have three groups. You have the inner circle, you have the outer circle, and I can't remember what they call the third group. Uh, Do you the, remember? Uh, Praetorians, I think? Or the, yeah, Praetorians. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The Praetorians, which uh, which is kind of weird because that's from, like, the Roman Praetorian Guard, but that, that's neither here nor there. Um, Maybe the Plebeians, something like that. It's, it's one of those plebes. plebes like, yeah, lower yeah. class, whatever. The Plebes, yeah. Uh, okay, so they're, of course the inner circle is, like, 1%. The outer circle is, like, another 10% on that, and then the... The other group is like 85%, or I don't know math, so that would be actually 89%. But it actually it follows a character who is working. He's part of the outer circle. He works for the inner circle, and what he does is he rewrites newspaper articles to reflect the views of the inner circle. So he pretty much is a propaganda guy and just goes back into the past and says, hey, everything that these guys say now is, is true. And a lot of terms, whether you've read this book or not, a lot of the terms that have come out of this book, everybody knows. Big Brother. That mm -hmm. is actually the name of the leader who might or might not be alive in this book. Um, and that is where we get the term, Big Brother is watching you. Because that was the that poster the in the book that they talk about. There's, there's, everywhere they go, they see posters saying Big Brother is watching you. And in screens, there's all these television screens everywhere that Big Brother's watching you, Big Brother's watching you. And pretty much they, they do – and he kind of theorized the internet, I want to say, um, back in 1948, which is kind of interesting uh, because yeah. they, they have a way of, of getting into your head – with these thought crimes, they have a thought police. If you think outside the lines of what they want you to think, they're they're really trying to suppress individualism. Yeah, it, it wasn't the same. Like we're actually kind of closer to what one might think of being able to actually read thoughts because they couldn't read thoughts. It was just they would observe your actions really closely, and if they saw you do something that wouldn't necessarily be illegal but indicated that you were straying from the the right point of view by your actions, like you're doing something unusual or, or whatever, that was considered a thought crime. If you were doing things like using the wrong words, possibly, that could yeah. be considered a thought crime. And surveillance is everywhere in this in this <laughs> dystopian future. Um, they have cameras everywhere, I believe. Everybody's being monitored at some point, uh, all times of day, by, again, a central, central government agency. Big Brother um, is watching you. Again, that's where they get the terms. But it really... You look back at it, and especially after, you know, like the Snowden leaks and all this other stuff, you kind of see a lot of what he said uh, kind of warning us almost that technology and the, mm -hmm. the overreach of government. And it, it's almost coming to true, which is 
unfortunate, but sci-fi. You should look at some of these sci-fi writers. Um, who is it? Uh, somebody thought of the nuclear bomb in 1910. Which one was that? That was Orson Welles. Orson Welles did that one. Um, Orson Welles also thought of the laser beam, which you know, back in the 1800s, who could have theorized that? Uh, but it, it's just... I, I, I digress. It's just really, really cool. So, um, other things that you might have known you know about actually that you might not have known were inspired by this uh, the Muse actually their album The Resistance is actually like a themed album off of the book <laughs> so a lot of yeah, people don't a lot of pop cultural references still to 19, about 1984 mm -hmm. you, you hear people talk all the time about oh this thing is going to lead to a 1984 like society or Orwellian, Orwellian. society this or that or, or people will even say sometimes like just shout out the term like 1984 and everyone knows mm -hmm. they're talking about a surveillance state to thought crimes it's ultra control it's uh, you, th you look at movies like Minority Report now I, I, I believe that was loosely kind of inspired by this novel uh, yeah. where they again they try to pretty stop loose. crimes before yeah. they, they happen um, V for Vendetta pretty much they made no bones about pretty much stealing the setting for for this uh, for their movie in V for Vendetta from 1940 84. Uh, you also have, yeah, and that, that's, that's pretty much it. And it's funny because John Hurt was also in V for Vendetta, and I think he did it because he liked doing 1984 so much, which makes me want to go back and watch that movie. Here's another sci fi reference for you. There was an episode of Star Trek that was essentially 1984 in the, the torture thing where Picard gets captured by Cardassians, and they hmm. subject him to essentially a 1984 oh. like torture How many lights and psychological there? torture. How many lights are there? There are yep, three is, lights. Yeah. There so, are four lights, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it just shows that we're still being influenced by this book. So if you haven't ever read it, which I haven't, uh, join me. I'm going to go out and find a copy of the book probably and read it, maybe, if I read. You know, I have a copy of the book. Well, I'm going to borrow a copy of the book from my brother right there, <laughs> Brendan, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it because it really piqued my interest. But let us know what you think. Uh, have you read it? Is it a great book? Should I read it? Are you excited about this movie? Let us know just any of your thoughts. Hit us up. Could they possibly do it justice? Uh, that's another good question. Um, but hit Is us it up. All Comments really down below. a ploy to find out who's opposed to the government's will. Maybe, maybe ticket sales will they'll start monitoring you. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, but hit us up. Comments down below, of course. At what's my face on Twitter? What's my face at gmail.com? Google Plus and Facebook. Always good ways of getting a hold of us. And let's keep on rolling and talk about some TV. And that is because uh, Sherlock Season 4 has kind of been in the news. Now, uh, Mark Gaddis, uh, he is the co-creator of the Sherlock TV show. Now, if you haven't seen this, this is a BBC show, BBC show where it's amazing. That's the best way I can put it. It is one of my favorite shows ever, and I love the way they do the format. What they do is they have each season is actually only three episodes, but each episode is an hour and a half long, and so it's like you're watching three movies per season. Have you seen it, Brendan? Yes, in fact. This is oh, one I've have. seen. I've seen oh, a couple okay. episodes. I haven't seen the whole thing, but I have seen a couple episodes. It is, it is amazing. So we're up to season three. Those are all on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, go watch it right now. It is amazing. You can press pause on the video. We'll wait. Actually, we won't wait that long because that's 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 like nine hours worth of watching. More than that. Too late. They already paused. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> but, uh, but so yeah, Mark Gaddis actually did an interview with Radio Times recently, and he was asked uh, a little bit about the show. Uh, just you know, what are we expecting? He kind of revealed that we are going to get a one-off episode. Might be a little bit longer than the normal hour and a half. Might be like a two-hour movie. That's going to come out sometime in 2015. But then we're not going to get season four until actually 2016, which is kind of annoying that they wait like two, three years in between seasons. But if they do a good job with it, though, I, I can appreciate that. Um, it's not like we're we have a shortage of of shows at this point. That oh, we want more, more. I don't know. I mean, I've seen some other shows that that had that though uh, a two year gap between like the second and or third season or whatever like uh the bbc's uh the uh, robin hood um and unfortunately they came back with something garbage. that was yeah it, Gar it had hot, potential stinky garbage at certain hot points like there, garbage there was like four the episodes in the middle of it and you're like oh man this is going to be amazing again and better than ever before 
And then they're like, no, no, no. No, no, we're going to give you more of this hot garbage we've been leaving yeah. out in a dirty alleyway in thousand degree weather. It, it was just, yeah, I'm sorry. Sherlock was very disappointed. I mean, not Sherlock, I'm sorry. Uh, what, Robin uh, Hood. Robin Hood was very good for the first season, and then the second and third season kind of fell short. So. I like the second season, actually. But the, the well, third season. There's only season, three, right? Yeah, there's only three. Yeah. So, but uh, they, we're not on that. We're talking about Sherlock. And Sherlock, I mean, yeah, they've they've kept coming and they've kept coming great. And part of the reason I think that the show is so good and almost can do no wrong is because the acting cast is amazing. I mean, you have Martin Freeman who is Bilbo from The Hobbit, and you have Benedict Cumberbatch who's in everything nowadays, just because he's amazing in everything. He is going to be Doctor Strange too. That's that's what I think. I hope so at least. Um, but you have a great acting cast. But so really, he was talking about a little bit what's gonna help go on. So he, uh, Gaddis was talking about how, or Gatness, no, it's Gaddis, um, was talking about how they're really trying to follow uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's blueprint for the Sherlock mm-hmm. shows, which they kind of have. I mean, you had the Hounds of Baskerville. You have um, who's, who's Moriarty pops in and out. You have. I can't remember the woman's name, but the only one that was ever able to like fool Sherlock, and if you yeah, know the it. lady, and the you you have his uh, struggles with uh, various kinds of uh, substance addiction. Well, yeah, it was it was opium in the original yeah. one, and it's heroin in this one, and also cigarettes in this one. Um, so they do do an excellent job going back and forth between that. Uh, but they're kind of saying he was saying uh, get ready to expect some uh, heartbreak coming up. And uh, he left it at that. Now, if you are a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle fan, you kind of know what's going to happen because in the books, Watson gets married. It happens. And something mm-hmm. happens to Watson's wife. <laughs> so that's kind of what we're, we're going to be expecting. Um, but, you know, they do show that Moriarty will be coming back. That was kind of the little teaser they dropped at the end of Season 3. And if I just spoiled that for you, spoiler alert. I don't think it should be that big of a spoiler because that's part of the Sherlock series, isn't it? Yeah. You know, Moriarty shows up, doesn't, whatever. Yeah, so... <laughs> the the um, big rival, then. Yeah, he's he is the rival. So he will be popping back in, but yeah, I, I just don't want to wait until the year 2016 to get this this season four. I just wish they could give it to me now, so I could be happy. I am glad that they're giving me kind of like uh, something to hold me over in 2015, but I don't know. Let us know what you think. Do you love the show? Do you hate the show? What do you think the heartbreak will be? Is it going to be something happens to Miss Mary Watson, or what do you think it'll be? Uh, hit us up, comments down below. Of course, at Words My Face on Twitter, Words My Face at gmail.com, Google Plus and Facebook, always good ways of getting hold of us. But let's move it on to one of my favorite parts of the show, and that is the quick hits of the night. Mm-hmm. Remix. All right. So let's go on to the first quick hit. So everybody who wants their first peek at Star Wars and Jurassic World, get ready and watch some football this Thursday because apparently both of them will be dropping trailers sometime during the day during the football games. So Actually, we'll... I thought it was hilarious. I saw a trailer today about how there's going to be a trailer for Jurassic World during yes. football on Thursday. Yeah, people, <laughs> they did release a trailer that there will be a trailer during football. And apparently the same thing will happen with Star Wars. Not a trailer for the trailer, but there will be a trailer. So I'm kind of excited. I was like, yeah, I already... you get, get a little excessive there. Like I, I don't need you could you don't need to make Just a commercial little. that there will be another commercial. Like <laughs> <laughs> get ready for this commercial. Well, it's like when you have the Super Bowl commercial. Well, you have commercials about about Super Bowl commercials. They're like, watch the Super Bowl to find out. It's like really you can't just tell me <laughs> what it is. Uh, I guess they're like, we want to make our advertising dollars pay off. We paid three million dollars for the spot. You better watch it. So. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so it's not like right you have to tell people to watch the Super Bowl either. Though they're not going to watch it just for your one commercial. They're going to be watching it anyway. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just like I'm going to be watching said football games anyway. Yeah. It'll be even nice. people that watch it for the commercials are again going to be watching it for the commercials anyway. Like, yeah, so. <laughs> you're not. You don't need to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessary. Not necessary. But yeah, so get ready. Those will be coming up. I am kind of curious to see if we will see a little bit about the Star Wars villains going on with the trailer. Um, Because they've been pretty secretive about that. They kind of said they were Jedi hunters, but not much else has been said. So it's Darth Maul. I call it that. 
Right it now, would be really cool if it was Darth Maul. That would be cool. If you watched Clone Wars, the TV show, you know what happens with Darth Maul, and it is amazing. So if you haven't watched that, go ahead and watch the Clone Wars series. It's awesome. Um, but let's move it on to the next quick hit. Um, and so a new Howard the Duck comic is coming from Marvel. Get ready for that. I think it was because uh, everybody was like, wow, Howard the Duck is in Guardians of the Galaxy. We need a new comic. So we're about to get one. <laughs> okay. Uh, and if you I don't know about Howard the Duck. comic series. Uh, apparently an absolutely abysmal movie, but I heard it was a good uh, yeah. comic series. That is a movie that would make it to um, Horrible Movie of the Week, but I don't want to watch it. I don't want to. <laughs> so what's got it suggested in the comments uh, down below? If it does, I will have to watch it, but don't do it. Mm-hmm. But, eh. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I think it was pretty much his cameo in Guardians of the Galaxy. If you don't know about Howard the Duck, he is like an alien from another planet. He's kind of like Rocket Raccoon, uh, and he landed on Earth and becomes a detective. So, He's yeah. also one of the few... Um, Kind of very self-aware, like fourth wall breaking uh, characters. So he, he's aware of being in, in the comic at times. So, kind of like kind of like Deadpool, fun, yep. fun character. Deadpool and um, that's what they need. A Deadpool Dead- Howard the Duck crossover. Yes. <laughs> hey, you never know. It might happen. It might except happen. Except for except for Deadpool is is under Fox right now. So I guess it can't. Happen. Yeah, but not the comics. You could have a comic crossover. I don't care about the comics. I want to see it in a movie. Ah uh, well. Actually, maybe. maybe not because yeah. the Howard maybe the Duck not movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> but yeah, expect that comic to hit uh, comic book stores in March. So let's move it on to the next quick hit. And this is one I was trying to find some numbers. I couldn't find any numbers. But Super Smash Brothers Wii U is out, guys. I hope you played it. Did you play yeah. it, Brendan? I was playing it this weekend. I got it. Uh, uh, actually, my wife got it for me on Friday. Oh, nice. She got nice. it for me. I was like, yes. If you want to pay another, what is it, ten, fifteen dollars, you could get those amiibos. And I got um, two of them. Oh. My wife got me two of them anyway. Yeah, I got the so, Link and the Samus because you and, know, Link's going to be good for a lot of stuff. But anyway. Yeah, but I was always Fox. That was my character, so I, I don't think I could get an amiibo that wasn't Fox. Cheater. Fox, Fox is just cheap. Fox. He's he was weaker. Cheap. In, in but melee, he was faster. Cheap. In melee, yeah. he was like weaker, the but faster. Fox. It's balanced. All right, it's balanced. It wasn't balanced enough. No, balanced. He was balanced. Don't ever say he was not balanced. But he yeah, um, I don't have any sales figures for we uh, the Wii U edition, but it did pre-orders did break the record for pre-orders, which was set by Mario Kart 8. Uh, and so we're looking at it probably about nine million sold within the first week. Yeah, not only that, um, pre-orders. This was surprising me. Sold out the. Um, uh, adapter the the GameCube controller adapter that they released for mm. that's only compatible with this game and usually peripherals don't sell quite so well especially ones that are so particular but you can't find them anywhere I looked you can't mm. I looked online can't find them <laughs> I had friends that were saying they were looking at, at stores all over the place everyone's like nope those those were sold out with the pre-orders so well, that's pretty amazing people wanted their old GameCube controller with that. But let's move on to the next quick hit. Um, and that is box office numbers, people. I do this every week. Domestic box office, you have number one, surprise, surprise. It's The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 coming in with $123 million. And now I say that, but the studio is like uber disappointed about this. Uh, they were expecting about $150 million from the opening weekend. And okay. so it's like, yeah, poor babies made $123 million in one weekend. I'm so sorry for you, you know. So, is but it's a good two. weekend for movies usually. Like, I, I wouldn't think so. This is what the weekend before Black Friday. I guess Black Friday would be worse because people. Well, are I would shopping. think Thanksgiving weekend would be a good weekend for movies usually. So I bet <gasps> you, you people have extra time. A lot of people have off work. Yeah. So Friday, no, well Friday, whatever. But yeah, I could see maybe Saturday being a big deal after people are yeah. done with their shopping to go out to see a movie. But yeah, coming in number two was Big Hero number six with 20.1 million, bringing its three-week total to 135 million. And then you had Interstellar coming in with 15.1, and then Dumb and Dumber two coming in with 13.8. Why are you people still going to see that movie? Stop it. Wait for it to come out on DVD. <laughs> Don't even watch it then. I'm not a fan of Dumb and Dumber. Dumber. If you can't tell. But uh, you like Dumb and Dumber? 
I'm saying people love Dumb and Dumber. No, they don't love it. People don't love it. Okay, they do. That's why they spend millions of dollars watching it. But yeah, that was our quick hits of the night. All right, so let's move it on to our last story of the evening, and that is going to be our video game show uh, topic. Ah, surprise, surprise. It's not like we do it the same order every week. We don't it's do not. that. It's we not do. like that. I know we surprise you sometimes with the order of our topic. It's a trade secret. <laughs> don't let anybody know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And uh, I kind of wanted to talk about Telltale Games and how they're kind of reviving the uh, adventure game genre. Now, if you are asking, what do you mean, mm-hmm. adventure game? Not not like the Zelda, that's like an action-adventure genre. I'm talking about more kind of like the point-and-click of old of yesteryear, of the, you know, Day of the Tentacles, of the uh, Indiana Jones and, what was it, the Lost Kingdom, um, the, what, name a couple Sam of them. Sam and Max. Sam and Max. Uh, uh, Grim Fandango was Grim the Grim Fandango, King's Quest, um, Space Quest, all those. Legend those of Monkey ones. Island, Secret of Monkey Island, all Secret, the Monkey Well, Telltale Island. Games actually did Monkey Island, so. <laughs> you know, but uh, so Telltale Games so uh, a ago, so. is a studio um, that actually, when Lucas get, uh, Arts Games Division um, kind of broke up, these guys kind of went and started their own company, uh, and they've been making a lot of uh, different games. You might know them from the Walking Dead game, the Wolf Among Us. Sam and Max actually brought them back, uh, and they're coming out with a bunch of other ones. But it seems like they're they're trying to revive this almost dead, extinct. You know, formula of games. Well, for a while, it definitely was dead. Like, absolutely was um, Yeah, dead. between, like, 1999 and 2008, 2009. Yeah, yeah to, to a large extent, it was, it was um, after the release of uh, Grim Fandango. I've heard commentary from some uh, other game developers that used to work on adventure games that after Grim Fandango came out, it was this huge award-winning game everyone recognized as possibly the best game ever made. But it sold terribly, so publishers, uh, like the, the people putting out the money, were like, "If Grim Fandango couldn't sell well, and it was the best game ever, your game is not going to be the best game ever. It's not going to sell as well. This is a dead genre. We, we're not putting out money for this because even if we make the best game ever, it doesn't sell, right?" Plus, technology and everything like that kind of got past that genre. Uh, the the whole flat two D screen. I mean, yeah, you still kind of see it in some things, but we wanted more of a 3D environment. Well, Grim mean, Fandango did have a 3D environment, but a l- oh. little different. But um, and so did um, uh, would would you consider the uh, the like uh, Under Killing Moon, the Tex Murphy games? Yeah, but again, games? those were know. adventure games, point and click. But those were back in the mid '90s. Yeah, it was semi 3D environment, but not really. Yeah, yeah. but. Yeah. But yeah, so so I, I, they, they came out with The Walking Dead a couple years ago, and that's really what propelled Telltale Games into their stardom. Uh, that game won Game of the Year for a lot of different places, and I played it myself. I thought it was really cool the way they... Sam Max was also uh, a good setup, but you're right. It didn't, it didn't get as much attention, but Sam, the Sam Max... Uh, yeah, I got episode. those, and I, I, I thought they were kind of weak, to be honest with you, compared to the old Sam and Max game. Um, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, but The Walking Dead really, you know, killed it. Uh, the Wolf of among Us is another one that really did very well for them. And now they're actually um, making a Game of Thrones one and a border, Tales from the Borderlands uh, adventure game. And they're pretty much taking some of our favorite stories, uh, my favorite stories at least. You know, the Borderlands is a really cool environment. I'd really like to see where they would go with that. But Game of Thrones is awesome. Now, there's no word quite yet as to what the story, the story will center around. There was some rumors that it would be Rob's Rebellion, which is kind of the setup for the beginning of Game of Thrones. It's the story that was never quite told in the in the movie. Was kind of hinted at in the book, but never quite told in the movie. Uh, but it's just it's just a it movie brings or a couple TV questions. Show. TV show? Did I say movie? I meant TV show because yeah. Game of Thrones is a TV show. Same difference. Same difference. <laughs> but uh, it just brings a couple questions. Um, is this going to be the reboot of the point and click slash adventure games? And again, they're not quite point and click, but they're still that same. The spirit of the same ones. Are we going to start seeing other companies start creating this game other than just Telltale Games? Because well, right we now this, see it. this niche is really con- it's pretty confined to Telltale Games for yeah. any success, at least um, that I've seen. Yeah, I mean you can argue that that, but there, but you definitely have started seeing more interest in the last few years. Like there, there was that big push of interest when um, uh, Double Fine 
did their big Kickstarter. That was the first Kickstarter to, to, to do uh, for a game anyway to uh, generate two million dollars or more than two million. Set their records there um, for what, that what, for an adventure game one? for an old style adventure game. But that one really still kind of I, I didn't hear any big talk about that. That kind of that was released, I believe, and it, it was just didn't do much. Partially released. They ended up having to um, do it as episodes because they ran out of money. <laughs> that and was how do you run out of money deal. when you say we want what the original goal was like five hundred thousand, and then they got up to two million, and they ran out yeah, of money. Porn. And that's yeah, another because question because they made the project is... bigger. They made the project bigger as they saw the money, but then they didn't. Make, they, they, I guess, they over uh, are overestimated what they had from that two million when they made expanded the project out. Yeah. Well, and that's another question that we get is, uh, do you like the episodic games? Because these adventure games have now turned into episodic games. That's what you saw with The Walking Dead. I believe first season had six episodes, and the next season had six episodes. The Wolf Among Us, six episodes. Um, Sam and Max, six episodes. Uh, You're even seeing this um, manage to get ported to, to consoles with um, uh, the with like essentially downloadable content, right? Um, the... Um, it's a little what different with Back those. To the future. You, Back, Back to the, to the future. future. Well, that's another Telltale, Telltale games yeah. uh, game. And, so. and it's released episodic, and I have it on the PSN right now, and it's it's kind of interesting to see, like, yeah, the, these episodes and allows you to um, pick up and play the game first. Like that first episode is only, maybe often they'll give it to you for free the first episode, mm-hmm. and maybe just for a few bucks, and you try it out, and then you say, well, essentially, it's like a. a, a a demo that's really part of the game and you're like well I like it so let me keep going or you say it's oh, usually only about five dollars for most of these episodes if you get any of them um, even if yeah. you pay full price so yeah. that means if you get a game of six episodes you're looking at like thirty thirty five dollars you know yeah, so about the, the price of uh, a regular game and it works for them because it draws you in and allows them to also stagger the development and everything um, but it works for you as a consumer because you know, a lot of games, me per I personally, I'll get to a certain point in the game, even a game that I really like, and I'll just stop playing for yeah, a long time. Like I'll get to a point I'm like eh, RPGs. And after dull. I put like sixty hours into it, I usually stop right before the final boss. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go beat all the side missions before I go fight that final boss, and then I never make it. Yeah, and so if you're <laughs> playing like that, even if you do like the game, right, you, you can get those first four episodes and. If you ever finally feel compelled to uh, to finish that, then you can pay the money to get the last couple of things. But you're only paying for essentially more closer to what you actually play. Yeah. So, so that is nice. So I, I do appreciate that part of the genre. Uh, the yeah, the kind of pay as you go. Uh, if you want to stop in episode three, you're just done with it. Okay, you're done with it. You're you're not locked into the whole thing. You didn't pay for the whole thing. And, and if there's enough attention, they can uh, just continue the game without it seeming odd. Like when you, instead of having the the ex, the same kind of expectations of a sequel game where they ex, where consumers expect uh, a lot of big advancements, and instead of just the same mechanics, usually, you can just keep the same mechanics if things are going well, and say this is season two, or just say this is the next episode, whatever. For because a lot of their games are set up too that it doesn't have to be. Uh, consistent story like you're you are locked into one mission and you can complete it some games are are, a bigger overarching story in which case if there's a more logical end to a story segment um even over a course of several episodes but some of them it's just like hey add another one add Mm -hmm. another one exactly I, i believe that's how the first walking dead one went is I think they had a plan for six episodes, but if it didn't go well, they were going to stop at like four or five. But every episode kind of gave you, a, it wrapped it all up, said, yes, there's more out there that you can do possibly, but, you know, it wraps it all up. Um, but that also, you know, we're seeing a good, of, uh, not a flood of them, because it's really, like I said, it's only the one studio that's really coming out with a lot of these. But are we going to get, and again, Double Fine, there's a couple other ones that are dabbling, but it's really Telltale Games that's it's really pushing this forward. Are we going to see either a bigger explosion of this with other groups jumping into it and then a burnout? Or you think people are just going to say, okay, Telltale, that's your niche. We're going to leave it to you. You go ahead and do that. I, I honestly think it's it might... We're starting to see, I think, a, a little bit of a, a ready for a bang, right? But it's more of a bang 
after a hard push to return the genre from being dead for so many years. Because it used to be, it was a long, long time that adventure games were a big deal, were really well, yeah. prime games. I mean, for especially with the, the PC, when every house got a computer in it, every computer, PC computer, had a point-and-click adventure game to go mm-hmm. with it. Uh, I remember our first PC in our house, we got Day of the Tentacle with that, yep. and that was an amazing game. I love yeah. that. And then Lucasfilms brought out a lot of them. Uh, I want to say one was called Full Throttle, where you were a biker. Um, yep. Again, there was the Indiana Jones one, which was a lot of fun. You had the Space Sam Quest, Max. King's Quest, Sam and Max. You had all these great ones coming out, and I'm sure there's a plenty. Grim Fandango, again, that was kind of I was kind of done with the genre by then, but that was a really good one, too. So it, it's just... I'm worried that they're going to explode and then die out again, and then we're going to see it come back sometime later. It's kind of like what we've seen with with superhero movies. I believe Mm -hmm. in the 70s there was a lot of stuff with superheroes, TV shows, movies, and everything like that. We saw a huge explosion, and then it died out for a good 20 years, and now it's back. Yeah, we'll have to come and wait and see. I kind of think that we'll see a a small resurgence of of stuff. I don't really see an adventure game getting... um, at any point, even as a weird bang, um, the kind of sales that you know, Call of Duty had for Black Ops 2, for instance. I don't see it uh, getting that kind of you know, 10, 20 million sales, but I could see it getting to a couple million, right? Doing a good job enough to get noticed, and we see that happening a couple times, and then I see it you know, kind of fizzling down a bit, but staying around. Um, as opposed to what we had previously of it, it, it reached a height, it fizzled down, and then dropped completely for mm. for a long yeah. time. I, well, I see it staying so around pretty much, at this point. If we see EA start jumping into the game, or Activision, or 2K Games, uh, we're ready for it to about to die out. As long as it stays with the indie guys, the smaller developers who can take more time, or aren't expecting these huge commercial successes because they don't have the overhead of the larger studios... Um, I think we'll be all right with the genre. I think it'll continue to release quality games like it has so far. Uh, the Walking Dead was great. Uh, Wolf Among Us only played the first episode, but that was a very entertaining one. Like you said, you played the Back to the Future one. That was a pretty cool one. Sam and Max, I am a fan of that. I just didn't quite like the new one. Um, but I am interested in the Game of Thrones one. As a Game of Thrones fan, I, I am interested to see what type of story they'll be able to tell because if you know Telltale Games stories... Um, they give you a lot of choice, and what you make, what decisions you make, stay with you throughout the rest of the episodes. So, it, it'll be a really cool way, especially in a in a setting like Game of Thrones, where there's already so many main characters dying left and right. To see how many different ways you can play through it, and how many different characters will stay alive or will die, they really kind of put that choice in the gamer's hands, which is something we've been seeing more and more and more with games nowadays. I mean, you look at the Mass Effect series. If you played all three Mass Effect games on the same system and had the same saves, they were bringing up stuff in the third one that you did in the first one, or stuff in the second one that you, you know, they were bringing up stuff from the first one. You know, it, it just a lot of ripple effects. And I just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I like that. So, it's also just let us know that, what you that nice way of storytelling that you can go yeah. with adventure games that you don't see as much. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it really, it really keeps nice dialogue and storytelling. Exactly. But let us know what you think. Are you excited to see adventure games come back? Do you not like this genre? Are you were you glad it died? Hit us up comments down below. Of course, at words for my face on Twitter, words for my face at gmail.com. Good plus and Facebook. Always good ways of getting a hold of us. But I think that's gonna be about it for tonight's episode. And if you want to choose for us to continue on to Thursday's episode, click the yes button now. If you don't, click the no button. And if you want Brendan to die in this episode, don't click yes. That would be very mean. But it's your choice. This is the point-and-click adventure. (laughs) Chewbacca is sitting right next to him with a chainsaw to carry out your orders. But as always, I am Brian. With me, as always, maybe not for very long, producer extraordinaire Brendan. Yo. (laughs) And we are going to headbang our way out of this joint.
and good night, everybody. <laughs>